The Buddha once said that the results of action are an imponderable. Which may sound strange given that his teaching on action is so basic to all of his teachings. In other words, you do or say or think something with a skillful intention and the results are going to be good. You do or say or think something with unskillful intentions and the results are going to be bad. That's simple. But the problem is that that simple principle gets iterated many, many, many times. How many th times in the course of the day have you done something or said something or thought something? You can't count all the actions. And that's just in one day. Then it spreads out over a lifetime or lifetimes, and you begin to realize that you've got a lot of things going on here. It turns out some of the actions will give results quickly, others will give slowly. Others are ready to give the results, but you're not watering them. And so they don't give the results. Others are a long time from giving the results, and you water and water and water them, and nothing seems to happen. In other words, it's the complexity of the interactions of all of our actions that makes the results of action an imponderable. When you bring this to the meditation, this is one of the reasons why when people ask, how long will it take for me to gain jhana, or how much longer will my meditation be miserable? And there's no answer. Because each person's karmic background is really, really complex. And it's not the case that what we see right now is just simply the running balance in our one karma account. The Buddha's image is of a field with lots of seeds. And as I said, some of them are ready to sprout, some of them are not. And who knows what the seeds are in your field. So what this means as you come to practice meditation is that you can't set a timeline or a deadline for when you're going to get the results you want. You just trust that putting in good action, putting in skillful action, is going to help. To make another comparison, it's like a very large tree growing. You give it fertilizer and you have no idea where the fertilizer is going to go in the tree. Whether it's going to cause the roots to grow deeper or the branches to grow longer or the leaves to get better. You may read on the label of the fertilizer bottle that this is a fertilizer that's designed for leaves and this is another fertilizer that tends to encourage roots. But which root, which leaf, you don't know. So you do your best. You learn from looking at other people. You learn from other people's advice. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we have monasteries, and why the Buddha set up the institution of what they call dependence, where young monks stay with senior monks for at least five years. Not just to hear the Dharma, because nowadays you can hear the Dharma all over the web. But on the one hand, to see good examples, hopefully you had a good example for your teacher, and also to give the teacher an opportunity to look at you to see what's lacking. Because you may have the idea that you'd like to have some really long branches in your tree, but what you really need are some better roots. And so the teacher's got to tell you, these, this is what you got to do for the roots. And when the tree is going to be fully mature, we can't say. That's why the dependence is at least five years, and sometimes it can be longer. So you learn from others, and you have to learn from your own observation. As the Buddha said, there are two things that are most helpful to bring about awakening. One, the external factor, of course, is admirable friendship, ad friendship with admirable people. And the internal one is appropriate attention, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. What's noble about these truths? I mean, you look at them and they're pretty ordinary. There is suffering in life. Oh yeah, everybody knows that. It 
And some people might notice that, yes, it does come from craving and ignorance. What's noble about the truth is the fact that Buddha said you've got to give these your top priority. He singles them out as the, the truths that you have to really look into, that you'd have to try your hardest to, to understand what is suffering after all, what, what is stress, however you want to translate dukkha. And what is the mind doing that's giving rise to more stress and more suffering over and over and over again? Many people want to look into this problem at least some point in their lives. But again, it's when you take this issue as the primary issue in your life, that's when the truths become noble. In other words, they stand out beyond and over and above everything else. So you don't just stick them into the corners of your life. This is one of the reasons why we, again, have the monkhood, have the monastic life, have the opportunity for people to live in a community where the bottom line is not the money, but the bottom line is the fact that you're trying to train your mind. Because that gives you moral opportunities. That doesn't automatically guarantee. There was one time when someone asked the Buddha, which is the better life style, the, the monastic or the, or the lay? And he said, that's a question that deserves an analytical answer. depends on the person. Some people live a monastic life and they really mess it up. Other people live a lay life and they do a really good job in the practice against the odds. The odds are better when you have time to take off. You don't have to worry about your job and your family. You can focus directly on the mind. But simply time or time put in does not guarantee anything. Even if you put in 10,000 hours, it's not a guarantee that you're going to come out really good at the practice. It requires that you observe and that you do pay really close attention to this issue of where is the stress? What are you doing that's adding extra stress onto the mind? And what could you do to relieve that and put an end to that? You have to look at all the various issues in your life that you're concerned about, and you have to peel away the other ones that get in the way of this one. That's when the truths become noble. So that's when you give them the opportunity to do a lot of good work in your mind. It's like that saying they have that when an alcoholic goes into someone's house, you'll know pretty quickly where the alcohol is kept in the house, because that's the issue that keeps eating away at him. Where is he going to get his next drink? Well, for a meditator, you have to know, where are the Four Noble Truths right now? At the very least, where is the stress? Where is the cause? What are you doing to develop the factors that are going to help put an end to the cause? So every morning you want to wake up and ask yourself, okay, where are the Four Noble Truths? Where are these things right now? And what are you doing with regard to them? You want to make that the first thing in the morning, the last thing at night, everything in the course of the day. Those are the big issues. Because when you allow these truths to be noble in your life, in other words, to take priority, then you've got the opportunity to become a noble person yourself, to see the noble attainments. Because the other aspect of the noble truths that's noble is when you look at the path, like we chanted just now, all those factors are really noble things. There's no place where the Buddha tells you to do anything dishonest or anything slipshod, anything that's harmful to yourself or harmful to other people, anything that you would later regret. You're developing noble qualities in the mind. This is why they say that the path is admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. It starts with admirable intentions uses admirable means, and then the goal is admirable. So 
to allow the truth to be noble in your heart. And they'll give your heart nobility. <laughs>